inviting us here. Uh, we're very honored and privileged to actually be part of this uh, experience where we're helping you guys uh, talk about e-learning as you're, as you're launching your, uh, your first e-learning initiative. So we're, we're actually extremely excited. Um, Dr. Michael Ori has actually been an innovator in the field of instructional technology for the past uh, almost three decades. Um, he started his career in the uh, University of Georgia in the early 1990s, and uh, he's one of the original founders of synchronous online learning. He actually started doing this uh, in uh, the, the late 1990s, where it's actually uh, teaching uh, people from all over the world uh, online using a synchronous uh, distance learning technique. Um, he is one of the, uh, the pioneers of uh, instructional theory and instructional strategies for actually building uh, online learning objects and developing uh, learning models and learning theories that actually work for uh, the, the digital age. So I, I'd like to uh, uh, resoundingly welcome Michael Laurie to actually uh, come and give his presentation and uh, you know, thank you guys again for, for inviting us here. said, uh, it is an honor to be here. This is a, quite an event. I've never uh, given a talk where we had uh, tinsel all over uh, in the air and on the floor, so it's pretty exciting. Um, and it's really an honor to be here. Uh, they told me this microphone, I could speak English, and what you would hear is Arabic. Is it working? <laughs> so, so I want to talk a little bit about e-learning, and so I'll just go ahead and get started here. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about online learning, what, what's going on in the United States, and then uh, I'm going to talk about what's the difference between online learning, face-to-face, -face, and blended learning. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what are all these things that are available in an online world. So I want to start first by asking the question, how many of you have taken an online class before? Okay, so I'd say maybe 10%, 10%. So with only 10% of you having taken an online class, I guess my next question is going to be even much smaller number. How many of you have taught an online class before? Very few, but still quite good. Excellent. So, oops. Where am I? So, so it's, when I've asked this question in the United States now, I, I, I've given those same questions to people in the United States. I ask that question, it's probably more like about 70% of the audience that has taken an online class. It's unusual now that people have not taken an online class. And that's sort of my expectation is well, that's what's going to happen here very shortly. So, so here's just a little bit of statistics about what's going on with online education today in the United States. 65% of higher education institutions now say that online learning is a critical part of what they're doing. The estimate in 2010 is that over 6.1 million students in the United States were taking at least one online class during the fall semester. What's, what's happened in the United States is there's MOOCs. How many of you have taken a MOOC before? Heard of a MOOC? One person. So a MOOC is a massively open online course. Uh, Coursera is one of the big uh, providers of MOOCs. They're taught by uh, uh, professors from all over the world, uh, a lot of them from the United States. And what happens is in a MOOC, you have about 100,000 students that take that class from all over the world at the same time. There, there has been an emergence in the United States of uh, what is called a for-profit college. And uh, the University of Phoenix is one of the most uh, uh, successful of those for-profit colleges. And they have about two 
3.4 million students now in, in those four profit colleges, and most of those are online programs. What's happening is really uh, well-renowned universities like MIT and UCLA now have something called MITx or Empowered uh, that is a completely online alternative to, to what is available at their institutions. You have the University of Phoenix, as I mentioned, one of these four profits that has really grown with the number of students, and most of their things are online. Coursera is an example of the, of the MOOCs that are available. And what's happening is a lot of people are now no longer uh, uh, interested in just degrees, but they're interested in continuing and continual development. And so they take uh, uh, certificates instead of degrees, or continuing ed credits instead of college credits. So just as an example, I'm coming from the University of Georgia. Here's, here's sort of a high-level picture of the campus at the University of Georgia. It was founded in 1789. The size of the campus is about 0.8 kilometers by 4 kilometers. It, it covers about 759 acres. There's 389 buildings on campus. In 2012, they spent about $50 million on building more buildings on the campus. There are 35,000 students that come from all over the world to study at the campus. One of the probably most important buildings on campus is our library. There are 4.7 million volumes in our library. There are more than 18,500 square meters of space in our library with an annual budget of $5 million a, a year. So what we have at the University of Georgia is this incredible infrastructure for teaching classes face-to-face. -face. In my program, all of our master's programs, we offer a master's program in instructional design and development, a master's program in instructional technology, and a master's program in school librarianship. All of them are online. So it's, I have this beautiful campus with hundreds of buildings, and all of our master's program are all online. The only thing that's face-to-face -face is our PhD program. This is our building, not as beautiful as this building, but it's this big building on campus, and our master's students never step foot into that building. So, so this is what's happening in the United States, is, is institutions like the University of Georgia that have been wholly committed to teaching, and teaching face-to-face -face are now changing. They're transforming. They're transforming their education systems to doing more and more online education. So the thing that I, and I've been teaching online, as Josh said, since 1998, and people ask me all the time, what's better, face-to-face -face or online education? So I, how many of you think that face-to-face education is much better than online? A couple, good. More, excellent. I would say that some of you are not being honest. I think that probably most of you should have been raising your hand. Most people think that face-to-face -face education is much better than online education. And I don't think that that's true. And, and I think that this, what I'm doing right now, is a great example. Here I have a picture of someone else doing the same thing. I went to uh, another university as an undergraduate student. I went to Purdue University in Indiana. I, I was a mathematics major. I took Calculus 1, Calculus 2, and Calculus 3 with 500 of my closest friends. The classroom had 500 students. The professor would work out problems on one overhead and then run over to another overhead and work out some more problems. You'd be frantically trying to work, write down all those solutions before he came over to this overhead, erased that, and started working out more problems. So you, with 500 of my closest friends, I'd sit and frantically take notes. If that's what face-to-face -face learning is, I'm not sure that that's a really great model for education. So alternatively, online education, what a lot of people are doing with online education is they're saying, okay, well, I need to cover this co content. I need to cover um, you know, how, to, how to be a good leader or how to be a good manager. And so what they do is they put a published paper and they make it into a PDF format and they put it online and the students read that paper and then they take a multiple choice test. And that's the extent of their experience with an online education. I would say that both of those experiences, this experience and the large lecture experience, 
are not necessarily a very valuable educational experience. In fact, I'd say in the large classroom that this student's experiencing distance education. Do students learn from bad instruction? Absolutely. So, so this is the real challenge that we have in, in my research area, which is learning, is that you can do something awful and people are still going to learn. I love the quote by the previous presenter that, that if you want to learn, no one can stop you from learning. And that's the, pro that's the challenge we face is that you can do things really poorly and people are still going to learn. But you can also do things really well, and they'll learn better. So, so I, people often say, what is good teaching? I think the best question is, how do people learn best? What's the best way to create an experience for people to learn? And so and what I'm doing here is, 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 is standing up and talking to you. So is, is telling learning? No, but it can be. So you could be sitting there actively listening to me and hearing this Arabic that's coming out of the speakers because I'm speaking English into my microphone, and you're actively learning and putting it together with what you've already know about online learning and about blended learning, but it, 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 it not necessarily is an active learning experience for you. So telling, there actually is, so of all the models for learning that we have today, um, so with, we have cognition, information processing, we have Piaget's theories on learning, we have Vygotsky's theories on learning. None of those theories of learning say that the best thing to do is to stand up in front of an audience of about 200 people and talk. None of those learning theories say that's the best thing to do. In fact, if you just missed what I said, sitting in this audience, you can't hit the pause button and slide the scroll bar back and hit play again and, and play it over again, you have no, I'm already going forward, I'm going to the next slide, and you want to go back, you can't go back now. So students must be actively engaged in the content, and the teacher needs to be there to help. In fact, one of the things, one of the cliches that I use all the time in, in, in the United States is what we're, we want to have happen with teachers is we want them to move from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. And that what, what that means is that we want the learners to be actively doing what it is that we want them to, to learn. We want them to use what we're learning, and then what you want to do as a teacher is to help them with it as they're engaging with that content. And that's what I think the, the, the blended solution really, really solves. It is that that... That is exactly what you can achieve with a blended learning model. So not only do students need to be actively engaged in the content, they need to receive the support from their teachers, and they also need to engage in discussions with the other students. They need to talk about what they're learning. They, whenever you're exposed to new content, you have to, you have to begin to believe in that content. You have to really understand that content, and a really good way of understanding that content is through discussions with other students. So you want to have the students actively engaged, you want them scaffolded by the teachers, and you want them discussing the content with the peers. And it all can be mediated by technology. Of course, the problem with today's students is that today's students, I take my son who's 16 years old as an example, he is what we call a digital native. He knows technology like it's a part of himself. And most teachers today, most of the teachers who are my age, don't know anything about technology. So I like this picture here where, as the teacher, my technology is an abacus. Their technologies are mobile technologies, computer technologies, tablet technologies. Students today are very technologically sophisticated. So why not online? Why not online as a solution? So I asked this question, what's better, face-to-face -face or online learning? And I think that the answer that I always have to give is that it depends. And so you can have awesome face-to-face -face experiences, and you can have awesome online experiences just as easily as you can have awful experiences with both of them. So I think that what you can do with online learning is you can help students to engage in content and then with the blended solution, you can have them actively applying that knowledge while you help them. So let me, 
Let me take as an example one of the things that we've done in our program in the United States. As I said, they're all online, but back in 2000, what we decided was we really needed to have more students in our program, and in the state of Georgia, which is depicted here in yellow, there are about 10 million people that live in the state of Georgia. And 5.5 million of them live in um, Atlanta, here in the red dot. Athens is where the University of Georgia is. It's about a one and a half hour to two hour drive between Athens and Atlanta. And so it's kind of far away. And so what we always did in our program is expected students to drive that hour and a half or two hours to come to the Athens campus, to our beautiful buildings and our beautiful campus to take classes. And what happened is more and more students weren't willing to do that. So what we came up with as a solution was we would admit a whole cohort of students, about 35 students, in the fall semester. And in the fall semester, everybody would take two classes. One of those would be at a campus close to Atlanta, and one of those classes would be online. So every semester, they had one class face-to-face -face and one class that was online. If the online class needed to meet with the students, the professor who was teaching the online class would ask the teacher who was teaching the face-to-face -face class if they could go on a particular night when they were teaching face-to-face -face and work with the students on that night. And so this was really wound up being a very useful solution at, at the time. I think at that time, in 2000, the students really weren't ready for a completely online degree program. No one really understood. If I asked the question as I asked today, how many of you had an online class back in 2000, I would have gotten about 10% of the students, or maybe even less. So very few students had an experience with a fully online coursework. The faculty in my program also were not ready to teach fully online classes for a variety of reasons, not, not the least of which is it's a lot of work to take your, your class notes and move them to some form that would be delivered online. And the other thing that happened was back then that people did, a lot of people did not have anything more than a dial-up connection. Do you all, do you all ever, had you ever had a dial-up connection where it goes that kind of dial-up, so the phone, and it was really, really slow and very unreliable. So if you fast forward from 2000 to 2014, everyone in the United States now has uh, high bandwidth connections in their homes. And those high bandwidth connections range between six megabits per second to 30 megabits per second. So everybody has a pretty fast internet connection in their home. The other thing that's happened, as I mentioned, there's this emergence of these for-profit universities like the University of Phoenix. Actually, one of the big competitors in the United, in, in, in Georgia is a university called Walden University. And Walden University did not exist until about 2000. It, they created this university. It's a completely online university. And now about 40% of the teachers in the state of, of, of Georgia get their degrees from Walden University. We did not have to compete with them back in 2000, but today we do have to compete with them. So we also have to compete with the other universities that are on the ground, but I think that what's happened is not only is the infrastructure there, but students now, if I ask an audience like this, again, about 70, 80% of the students have already had an online class, and, and many of them had very good online experiences, and now the faculty are also ready to teach online. They're tired of driving to Atlanta to teach a class. So last year, we converted all of our master's programs to 100% online. Now, that's no longer blended. It's a completely online solution. I think blended has been perfect for us. I expect that blended is going to be very good for you as well. So I, I, I enjoyed the presentation before. Uh, I think that what you have as a plan is fantastic. I think that this building is just incredible. And I think that the, 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 uh, the ads that we saw are just uh, heartrending. And, and uh, I think that what you have here is a really powerful program. So, so why blended learning? Well, in typical education, what happens is you spend about 50% of your time presenting content. If you've taken a, 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 a looking at the, the people here, you all have a college degree, you probably went to the university and the 
teacher spent most of the time talking and you spent most of your time taking notes and then you would spend a little bit of time on learning activities at home. You might be reading, you might be doing homework, you might be writing papers, and you might then spend a little bit of time on, on, uh, on exams. And really this has become a really important issue with online education, and that is time. Now I've only been here since late Saturday night, about midnight, and one of the things that I, I recognize right away is that Cairo has a little bit of traffic. <coughs> Cairo seems to be, if you want to get from one part of Cairo to the other part of Cairo, it takes a little bit of time. So if you've got to take a class and where the class is taking place is on the other side of town, it could take you two hours or more to get there and two hours or more to get back. There's a lot of time if you're taking a professional development course, it's a lot of time that you spend on the road. Well, in a, in a blended solution, that content that you're, you're exposed to, now you get it all online. And you have control of the content. You can hit pause, you can hit replay, you can play it over and over again. If it's a really fascinating lecture, you can listen to it twice. If you don't understand things, you can scroll back and, and play it again. If you get distracted, you can, you can scroll back and play it again. Okay? Then what you can do with blended learning is that you can do all the applied activities in the classroom. There's a construct now in the United States. Has anybody heard of the educational concept called flipping the classroom? A couple? So, so the idea of flipping the classroom is even in a traditional class like this, if we met every day for the next 10 days and we had class, what I would do is instead of spending the class time on delivering a lecture, I would record all of my lectures. You would listen to the lectures before class, and then what I would do is do a bunch of small group activities in the classroom where you work in small groups and I walk around and work with you in small groups where we, you do a lot more interaction, a lot more engagement, a lot more of you applying that knowledge to, to the situation that you face. If you just learn, if you just are exposed to the content, it doesn't mean you're going to do it. And that's really what you want to have happen with education. The reason you're, you're taking a class, you're, you're getting professional development, is you, you want to do the latest and greatest thing. You want to be able to do the best thing for the patients that you're working with. And the best thing often is whatever the latest uh, 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 learning is involved in what you do. So, so what you do in a blended class is now you're spending 30% of your time doing this application. And the last little bit is on certification and examination. The blended solution is often more effective and much, and much more convenient. I say convenience because that's really what has emerged in the United States is people prefer the online solution because of convenience. And again, we have just as much traffic in the greater Atlanta area as you do in Cairo. And students want to be able to get from their place of work to their home, be safely in their home, and then attend their online classes. And, and, and people want that convenience, and they love that convenience. So the blended solution, uh, e-learning focused content and learning learners or uh, learner examination, this is, I think, the best solution here. I think that this is what, what the, this new institute is, is embracing, and I think it is a great solution. You get all the content online, and then you do all the application face to face. And it's all administered in an LMS, so everything is tracked. And once you complete it, you can then earn a certificate. One of the things that we've been working on is, is getting a, uh, the certificates all approved by the University of Georgia, and the University of Georgia then you, um, um, issues you continuing education credits. So online, face-to-face, -face or blended? Well, blended. I think blended is a great solution. I think that that's going to work for you. So, what is online content anyway? Well, teach online, you, you, re, you need tools uh, and you need, uh, the te you need the teachers and you need content. So what are tools? Well, the tools that you use are things like learning management systems. Does anybody in here know what a learning management system is? Uh, 
a second. So the previous presenters talked about a, a learning management system. Nobody knows what a learning management system is. A learning management system is where you log in, and, and when you log in, what you then are provided are the courses that have been assigned to you. That's where you go get your content. That's where you go play your videos. That's where you go take your tests. That's where you, all of your content is tracked. That's where your grades are. That's where all of the content is. That's, where the, that's what a learning management system does. The other tools are social networking tools. Discussion boards are often in a learning management system. Tools where you're interacting with each other. So, so when you're, you're learning something, you're learning a new technique, and you understand it, and now you're trying to apply it, you can go into the discussion boards or into the social networking site and say, has anybody else had this problem? I'm trying to do this, and it doesn't work. And then other people can then respond to it and say, yeah, I had that same problem, and here's what I did to make it work here. And so, so again, I think it's an important part of the process is to allow people to, 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 to ask those questions. And one of the things that happens with online classes is I ask questions here some people are brave enough to answer and raise their hand. If I asked you a question that required you to respond, some of you may not be willing to do that. In an online class, people feel a lot more comfortable asking those questions. And when they're working in small groups online, they're a lot more comfortable asking those questions. So tools are part of what you do. Of course, with most courses, you also need to have a teacher who's monitoring things who are, can respond to the questions uh, and to, to, to provide grades. Well, then you have the content. Where's the content come from? Well, sometimes the content's created by the teacher. Sometimes the content's produced by publishers or, or learning organizations like Takweer or, or Logic. Or sometimes uh, they're available online, freely online. So what is the content? Well, the content, can, there, there is a, a model for for uh, um, talking about the level of interactivity of the content. And it ranges uh, in these five levels, from level zero to level four. And level zero is, is PDFs and, and other reading materials. Level one is just sit back technology and sit and watch. It's narrated PowerPoints, it's videos, it's anything where you click the play button, you sit back and watch it. Level two, you click the play button, and then you have to click on next, and you have to click on next, and then it says, uh, did you understand that thing? I'm going to ask you a question now about what I just presented, and you have to answer that question. So it does kind of guiding questions. Level three is more like branching simulations, where you can actually simulate the kind of content that you're engaged in and, and make decisions about what you're going to do. And level four is full-scale simulations and games. So let's take a look at some of these contents. So level zero is reading content. Uh, one of the things I've created uh, since 2001 is a online book called Emerging Perspectives on Learning, Teaching, and Technology. It started with eight chapters. It now has 33 chapters. The original eight chapters was all text. Uh, the, the 33 chapters now have images, animations, interactive material, uh, narrated PowerPoints, videos, a variety of content. So here's, here's just a screenshot of the, the Vygotsky chapter. And uh, there's text, and then there's an interactive uh, flash animation. Again, this is level zero. This is where you're reading the content. Level one is, is basically videos. And videos can really be uh, uh, run the gamut. So in the top left-hand corner is a narrated PowerPoint. Anyone here ever uh, listened to a narrated PowerPoint before? Is that a good way to learn? So so, yeah. So so again, a narrated PowerPoint. You put the power. You you create your PowerPoint as the teacher. You hit record and you add audio to those narrated PowerPoints as you're going through it. You can then put it up online and people can then listen to it. Very easy to produce. So so in its effectiveness. You can also just uh, do a headshot video, as we have here, where you get a camera. A lot of people just use the built-in camera on their computer, and they just sit at their desktop, and they have a headshot, and the, 
and then they talk, and you see their face while they're talking. Is this, has anybody seen a video like that before? Is that good quality teaching? So-so, yeah. Again, easy to produce, so-so in its quality. Down here in the bottom is a video that we produced a, a couple years ago for children, and what we did is we created animations and we had live actors act on a green screen and then we put the actors into the, the animated world. Much more engaging, much more interesting, much more uh, effective for the learners, much more expensive to produce. So you can do level one content that's very engaging, but the more engaging it is, often the more expensive it is to produce. Now, level two, is what B.F. Skinner would call programmed instruction, what we call today tutorials online. And the basic idea of the tutorial, you, the, the top little box would be one screen of content. So it's saying there are four suits and a typical deck of cards. And uh, the next thing it does is it shows you a screen that says, how many suits are in a deck of cards? Four. So then it says, one suit is called spades, and spades are black, and it shows you a picture of a spade. A second suit is hearts. They're red, and it shows you a picture of the hearts. Then it says, what color are spades? This is a basic tutorial. Has anyone ever experienced e-learning like this? How is that? Fine, so-so. It's, it's an OK way of presenting. It's not too different than the narrated PowerPoint except now every two or three screens it's asking you a question about what it just presented. So at least it's, you have to lean forward a little bit to do that. You're not sitting back and watching. You have to lean forward a little bit and click every so often and actually have to think uh, spades are black or uh, there are four uh, suits in a deck of cards, okay? So level two, you're beginning to lean forward. You're beginning to get a little more engaged. This is a screen capture uh, of a, um, a piece of training that we did for the chaplain corps in the US Army. Um, one of the things, I don't really want to talk about this, but the US Army has been engaged in, in fighting in Afghanistan and previously in Iraq. A lot of those soldiers have died. The chaplain corps helps those soldiers, the surviving soldiers, with the loss of their comrades. And so one of the things they have to do is help them with the grief. So what we did is created a grief training uh, how, for the chaplains, because the chaplains aren't necessarily uh, trained in how to help people through, through the loss of life. And so this is a, a, a simulation where um, the, the, the chaplains are going through something where the, somebody's in, uh, having, experiencing something, and you basically make a decision and the story unfolds differently based on what you choose in each decision tree. So each decision tree kind of tells a different story. And so if you make bad decisions, then the person that you're trying to help doesn't get helped. And if you make better decisions, the person you're trying to help does get helped. And so, and there's a, a variety of levels to that. This is a tech, anybody experienced anything like that before? No, so again, a lot, a lot more expensive to produce but a lot more engaging, a lot more of leaning forward and paying attention and trying to figure out the, what to do in the content. Okay, uh, again, yesterday I spent all day at, at uh, Logic and, and Tatooine, and they are building these kinds of simulations today. And again, a lot more engaging kind of e-learning content. The other, the fourth level is simulations and games. This is a, a game that we created uh, with our plant breeding um, department, and we're teaching uh, sort of the history of plant breeding, going back to Mendel's peas and trying to make uh, uh, wrinkled peas and smooth peas and trying to crossbreed peas, what Mendel did, all the way up to genetic markers and using genetic markers to, to then uh, uh, try to figure out what's the best breed of strawberries or whatever. I think, uh, oh, the genetic one was tomatoes they were breeding in this game. And so in this game, again, a very much lean forward technology, you have to breed a certain kind of plant in order to ma make it to the next level of game. And, and each level 
get you deeper into what has happened from back from Mendel's peas to today's technologies for, for uh, doing plant breeding. We also worked with uh, Disney in uh, one of their gaming environments called Club Penguin, and we embedded a lot of mathematics and science into games that children ages five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten are playing. Again, a very lean forward kind of approach, also a very expensive approach to, to uh, e-learning content. But those are some of the kind, kinds of things that you can get in an e-learning experience. So what's the online experience? Well, you have to have exposure to the content. You either read content, listen to the content, or interact with the content, depending on the level. You often have some sort of simple knowledge check, which is often a multiple choice test, which are automatically graded. My stu I use the multiple choice tests all the time. I make them very low stakes tests. So what you do is you, you read something, you interact with something, you watch a video, and then I have a quiz on that. And you take the quiz, and what happens is you take the quiz, let's say it's a 10-item quiz, and you get a 50 on it. What I do is I then say, you can take the quiz again. And you can take it again. And you can take it again, and I just save the highest score. So usually, I don't have students that need to take it more than three times before they get 100, usually. And so... Um, but then what I do is that I use a live classroom, and I say, you can take it at the quiz as many times as you want, but at 5 o'clock on Tuesday, because we're going to meet in the live classroom at 5 o'clock on Tuesday, at 5 o'clock on Tuesday, you can't take the quiz anymore. So whatever your highest score is at 5 o'clock, that's what your score is. And the students like it, because it becomes like a knowledge check. When you read, how many people have gone online and taken a, a test, like the, an IQ test or a personality test? Find these online, free online? Yeah, lots of people. People like taking tests. It's kind of fun if it's low stakes for you to read a piece of content and take a test and say, oh, I didn't really get that. Maybe I'll go back and read it again, or maybe I'll pay co get more careful attention to answering those quizzes. I think that if you actually are successful at answering those quizzes, it actually helps you to understand and know the content better, okay? <coughs> and then we'll ask people to discuss it with the other students and with me. We'll do that in the live classroom. We could do it in discussion boards. I even have a student who created something. Anybody here use a program called Facebook? Oh, really? Only almost everybody. So, so he... One of the things that people have experimented with online classes, you want people to talk to each other. Well, Facebook wall is a great way to talk to each other. But you know what? When you're taking your class, you don't want a bunch of class content coming onto your wall in Facebook because what Facebook's for is for you to keep up with family and to keep up with friends and to interact with the people that you care about. And you're interacting with the people you care about, and then boom, up comes something that's about a class, and you know, they don't like it. So I have a student who created a Facebook wall application. Looks just like Facebook, behaves just like the Facebook wall, but it isn't Facebook. And the students like it because it looks like Facebook, it behaves like Facebook, they're familiar with it like Facebook, but it's not in their Facebook, and it's not interfering with them being able to uh, work with their family but it gives them an opportunity to interact with each other and to interact with the, with the teacher. And then the last thing is then you have to apply it, which is what's happening in this, this new initiative that we have here at the hospital, is you're doing the application of it face to face. I'm gonna give you some old, I'm gonna end with two very old theories, but I think these two old theories have become even more relevant today. The first is from the 1960s. It's called Dale's Cone of Experience. And so you have at the top, read, hear words, observe a still picture. Down at the bottom, you have do actual experience. Everything in gray, is we, we've kind of categorized as active learning. Everything above that is much more passive in learning. And what we want today in our e-learning experiences and our blended learning experiences is to be much more in the active learning. Because if you look over here on the le left, you see 10% of what you re read, you recall. 20% of what you hear, you recall. 
90% of what, the, what you say and do, you are able to, uh, are to, able to recall later. So again, we want active learning. The other very old theory that I'll bring up is Bloom's taxonomy. And Bloom's taxonomy, we have remembering and understanding as sort of the easier things, and the more difficult things are applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. And what you do in e-learning today, mostly the level zero through two are in the understanding and remembering level of, of, under, uh, of the content you have. The applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating can be done with the levels three and four. It also can be done with other e-learning experiences like assignments. And, and one of the things I have when I need students to do performances is I have them videotape those performances and they turn in the video the videos to YouTube and I can then see that performance. And I can have the students react to those performances and I can react to those performances. So you can get people to apply and evaluate and, and create solely through e-learning, which is what we're doing now with our fully online, and what you can do with your blended solution. So conclusions, e-learning is just as effective as face-to-face. E-learning is gonna continue to expand. Teaching and learning requires a human connection. I think, that, I think that one thing that's in common between medicine and education is that it's really the important part of medicine and the really important part of education is the human connection. The connection that you develop between the teacher and your, and your students and the, and the relationships the students have with each other. They're really vital for that experience. And you could do that in a blended solution. You could do that in an online solution. It can be mediated through technology. Okay? Thank you.